Okay, so why don't we get started? Um, all right, good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I am Lucas Liu, co president of Place NYC, and uh, I want to thank the many members of Place who worked hard to make tonight happen. And of course, uh, thank you to Congressman Lee Zeldin for taking the time this evening to speak with parents. Um, as many of you uh, know, Place has uh, endorsed Congressman Zeldin for governor of New York, and we wanted to give parents the opportunity to hear directly from Congressman Zeldin. Um, and just so everyone, um, everyone knows, uh, before we even decided to endorse Congressman Zeldin, we also extended an invitation to Governor Hochul to come and speak with parents, but she declined. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, this evening, uh, Place Co-Treasurer uh, Craig Slutskin will be moderating and asking questions submitted by uh, parents tonight. Um, but first, uh, let me turn it over to our guest of honor tonight, uh, Congressman Lee Zeldin. Well, thank you. It's great to be with everybody. Thank you for uh, hosting this opportunity to uh, be able to answer any questions that uh, any of you have on any topic. Uh, we're four weeks away from an election that uh, is very important for the city of New York. It's important for the state of New York. It's an important election for our kids, for our families, for our future. Uh, I got into this race just over a year and a half ago on April 8th of 2021. And it, quite frankly, a lot of the issues that motivated me to get into this race then are still very much prevalent today. Uh, we lead the entire nation in population loss. Uh, people are fleeing this state more than any other state. They are talking about how they don't feel safe in New York. They're talking about how their money will go further elsewhere. But people also talk about the quality of education. We saw those impacts in hard uh, during the pandemic. The pandemic policies on education were absolutely terrible here uh, in this state. Uh, the, the reliance on remote learning, the, the I mean, it really is no substitute for full-time in-person learning. Uh, the masking policy, especially at the end, when you, you only saw the masks forced on our kids at two, three, four years old when the masks were coming off everybody else. Uh, we have uh, an important conversation to be had here about specialty schools, about lifting the cap on charter schools, on the quality of education in, inside of our schools. So I, I know that we're going to have a great q and I know that this group is uh, heavily focused on education issues, but I'm really more than happy to answer any questions that you have with regards to anything. Grateful for your support. And uh, hopefully after today, uh, as you're going through the final 28 days, please talk to everybody you know and encourage them to do everything in their power to take control of their own destiny, their own future in helping us to save the state. Thank you, Congressman Zeldin. We now have questions for you that are from our members, primarily parents and guardians of New York City public schools. I'd like you to try to take about two minutes to answer each question so we can get to as many as possible. My first question is about the relationship with our mayor. Parents were frustrated by the constant bickering and lack of cooperation between Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio on education issues, particularly around school closures. How important do you think it is to have a good working relationship with the mayor of New York City, and do you foresee a good one with Mayor Adams? Uh, it's extraordinarily important for the governor to have a good relationship with the mayor. I'm confident that the story that will be written in 2023 is how well Governor Zeldin is working with Mayor Adams to be able to move forward the city uh, to serve our mutual constituents. I served with uh, Mayor Adams for four years in the state Senate. We've stayed in touch since. Uh, and I believe that there are many aspects of uh, issues related to crime, to education and much more where we absolutely can find common ground. Uh, and I believe that that will be a story that will also restore confidence for New Yorkers Instead of seeing the, the partisan bickering uh, and the infighting and uh, seeing people trying to stab each other in the back, actually what the average New Yorker wants to see is their governor and their mayor working together. And that's something that I'm committed to doing. I've always gotten along well with, uh, with Mayor Adams and I'm sure that will confident, that I'm very confident that will be continuing next year. Thank you. Many public school parents were pleased with Chancellor Banks' recent announcement that schools are gonna be able to reinstate and use academic screens for admission standards. 
but the demand for accelerated programs and screen admissions still outstrips supply. How can the state help city families create more of the kind of accelerated coursework education that many parents want for their children? So I support advanced academics, the gifted and talented program. There's a push to get rid of it. Uh, supposedly, they say in the name of equity, they say it's not fair for the student who isn't reading or doing math at the higher level to be giving these advanced academic opportunities. I couldn't possibly disagree with that uh, any more strongly. Uh, we need to support our gifted and talented programs. We need to uh, acknowledge and promote hard work, merit. Uh, people should be rewarded for working hard in school, preparing for tests and, and trying hard to succeed. Uh, there should be more technical education inside of schools. Not everyone plans on going off uh, to higher ed. We have to make the diploma worth more as well. Uh, it's, uh, I think competition is healthy. Uh, listen, I went to public school. My daughters went are going to the same public school that I went to. Uh, there's history in my family. My mother's a retired public school teacher. My father's mother is a retired public school teacher as well. My father's father was a public school teacher. With all that being said, all kids deserve access to a quality education, regardless of race, ethnicity, wealth, or zip code. Uh, and part of delivering a quality education is making sure that instead of having a one-size-fits-all graduate, you're challenging all students to do the best that they possibly can in life, challenging them to go as far as they possibly can in life. And that's something that I'm totally committed to doing to help. Just to follow up on that, two follow-up questions on that. What legislation would you propose or support that would guarantee all of this? And also, where do you see testing falling into these programs? Uh, so I feel like there's too many unfunded mandates from the state. There's a lot of extra money that gets spent in these local school districts, maybe even well-intentioned, uh, but it comes with a, a huge cost. Uh, I believe that you know it's, this isn't just about putting more money towards education. Uh, I understand that, you know, listen, there's a lot of money that gets spent on education. We have to make sure that we're getting the, the maximum product for the money that is spent. Uh, I care most about outcomes and I care about students first before, uh, before teachers. And I, and I love our teachers and thank God for our teachers who are willing to sign up for the, the toughest assignment. If we didn't have a, a teacher willing to sign up for the poorest performing public school, then those kids would be that much further set back. Uh, so it is important to invest in education, but it's not just about spending a dollar and not really caring where it goes. So that the state has incredible leverage as it relates to education aid that gets sent to schools. And we should be asking about where's the money going to ensure that you have these programs that are challenging students to go as far as possible. One of the ways to free up more money is certainly to, uh, to roll back some of these unfunded mandates or to fund them. If your idea is that good, great, then fund it. Uh, as far as tests go, um, I believe that, you know, listen, tests are important to measure progress, but what you shouldn't be doing is over-testing our kid, kids, and what you shouldn't be doing is setting up our kids to fail while you're you're, you're testing them on material they have not yet learned. You have a, an environment inside of a class where they're just constantly teaching to the test and sometimes to the point where they're testing to the wrong, they're teaching to the wrong test because they're not even sure what they're supposed to get tested on. In some respects, you have a test that might be mandated by the federal government. In some cases, you might have a test created by the state. And in other respects, you have tests that are created by the local school district where the curriculums are set. So we have to be very sensitive and careful not to do too much of these high stakes over testing uh, where we need to make sure that our kids uh, have an environment that is promoting their learning and is an environment that is set up in the best interests of these kids. Uh, I believe as far as education aid dollars go, though, uh, we have to make sure that we have max outcomes challenging every student to be the best they possibly can be. Uh, and this is something that I think has been hindered. Uh, by the approach from Albany. Lastly, I'll say is we have over 700 school districts in the state, and there's a lot of efficiencies that can be found in the way these schools are run. In some respects, you have a big school school district. New York City, that's a huge board of elections. Uh, that's a huge um, a board of education. Uh, but you also have a lot of school districts, and they're all doing their own uh, uh, math, director of math, director of science, social studies, uh, you, you superintendents, deputy superintendents, principals, all of this ends up chipping away at one big education pot. 
we need to make sure that that money is being spent as efficiently as possible. So you have max to go to education uh, and none of it to be wasted as little as possible of these precious tax dollars being wasted. Just one follow up question on, on testing. Where do you fall on the Shasat for specialized uh, high schools in New York City? That's governed, as you know, by state law. Yeah, I, I believe that we should continue. Uh, these special specialized entry exams into these schools. We should be rewarding hard work. Uh, we should have merit-based entry into specialty schools. I think it's an important value to teach to our students. Uh, I believe that uh, a kid who works hard should not be penalized just because they check a particular box. Uh, my, uh, I, I have an Asian American wife. The fact that my daughters could check a box saying that they have an Asian American background and all of a sudden they're penalized because of that is wrong. Bill de Blasio was wrong when he made his comment saying that New York City uh, specialty schools don't look like America. And when he said it, he was talking about white students. I'm sorry, he wasn't talking about white students. Uh, so I believe uh, that this is something that should be promoted more, not less. Moving on to uh, the current state of the system, as New York City works to support asylum seekers and their children. It has become a huge financial strain on New York City schools and resources. What would you do as governor to address the ongoing migrant crisis as it impacts New York State and specifically New York City schools? There's, there's a few dynamics here of, of what's going on and what the governor can do about it. <coughs> um, I believe that with regards to people who are coming, regardless of whether they're getting flown in, uh, a bus is bringing them in, I wanna know who's coming, where they're coming from and where they're going. There's too many unanswered questions. There's too much secrecy uh, clouded around this entire process. There must be more transparency. Additionally, even if every blue state and red state mayor and every blue state and red state governor all got on the same page and they were all working perfectly together, the problem won't get any better tomorrow. It will just continue to get worse. We need the federal government to be doing a better job securing our Southern border. My position, I believe that we should finish construction of the border wall and catch and release and force the remain in Mexico policy, support our customs and border patrol agents, stop incentivizing and rewarding illegal entry. This isn't just about people who are coming across our southern border. It's also about things coming across like fentanyl and other narcotics killing our kids. So I, as governor, would be calling on the federal government to be helping by controlling, better controlling the flow of people into our country. This is only going to get worse as long as that is not dealt with head on. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether we're blue state, red state, doesn't matter blue city, red city. It doesn't matter whether you're a border city or you're not a border city. The reality is, is that we really do need the federal government to step up big time. I'm gonna move, over, move on to the topic of safety, which is a very big concern for many, many in our audience. Safety, not only within our schools, but certainly during the commute to, to and from school is a great concern. It impacts our students in many ways. Hundreds of thousands of students in New York City use the subway each day to commute to school, often on their own. How can we provide a safe way for our children to get to school? We have to take back our streets. Uh, a top priority of mine is to uh, do a lot more to secure our streets. We have streets that, uh, in some respects, it feels like criminals are in charge of that street instead of law-abiding New Yorkers. We have to support our men and women in law enforcement. We need to roll back pro-criminal laws that have been passed. We need to repeal Castle's bail, give judges discretion to weigh dangerousness. Uh, a person at a McDonald's on Delancey Street in Lower Manhattan can take an ax out of their backpack, swing it wildly at tables and walls and customers, and be instantly released back out on the street on Castle's bail. There was a new law that was signed called Less is More. Well, a woman was leaving a subway station at the Howard Beach train station just a couple weeks ago, gets attacked by someone who had once murdered his own grandparents. That person violated parole this past August. His parole officer was not able to detain him because of the Less is More Act. Uh, we also need district attorneys doing their job. We need DAs enforcing the law. I have pledged that my first action, the first day that I'm in office, is notifying the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg that he's being fired for his refusal to enforce the law. The, the, we've, had a, we've created this setting in New York where instead of being able to walk freely, 
15, 20 blocks on a beautiful summer night. Instead, if you're two blocks from home, you're calling an Uber just to go a couple short blocks back to your house. Areas that were once safe now aren't. Uh, we have to do more to restore balance up to Albany, uh, to support our men and women in law enforcement, to ensure that our DAs are doing their job, and to roll back these pro-criminal laws that I believe are eroding public safety on our streets. So since you mentioned Albany, if elected, you're likely going to work with an overwhelmingly Democratic state Senate and Assembly, including several members of the DSA. How does a Governor Zeldin work with that and get his legislative priorities addressed? Well, first off, I believe and I surely hope that there isn't a super majority in the Assembly and Senate. Uh, these self-described socialists in Albany uh, are currently uh, a, 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 essentially the difference maker, putting majorities over the top into supermajority status. If we could take away the supermajority status that exists in the legislature, there will be more of a balance of power. I'm concerned about uh, the, the reality if you have one party rule and supermajority assembly and Senate. I believe that it's important to not just have a balance of power between parties, uh, but also to ensure that it's not a supermajority in assembly and Senate. Listen, I'll work with absolutely anyone to find common ground, however possible. It, I, I will talk to everyone. I, I will hear you out. Uh, I hope that you are somebody who also will hear me out. There are some people who aren't interested in working with other people. And, and that's a reality. There's 213 state legislators. Someone would probably eagerly nominate themselves as 213 out of 213 as far as bipartisanship. That person will out themselves. But also, you will have plenty of people who will want to actually do something good. It's a sacrifice to serve an elected office. There's some member of the state legislature, and maybe they're in a different party, but they are spending time away from their families. They are taking a pay cut. They are serving in public service to do something good. And my job is to work with any of them and all of them to try to find common ground however possible. Congressman, parents are divided on how topics such as race, sexuality, and gender are taught in school. To what extent do you feel parents should be involved in the decision on how these topics are approached in school, and as the governor, what steps would you take in furtherance of that? Parents should be totally involved in their child's education. They are in charge of their child's education. They are in charge of their child's upbringing. I believe that a parent has a fundamental right to control the upbringing of their child, and they do not relinquish that right by sending their kids off to school. Uh, I will, on day one, affirmatively state that in an executive order I will sign, saying that, that this executive branch recognizes the, and, and I believe it is a fundamental right, a parent controls the upbringing of their child. The best thing for a child's education is for a parent to be as involved as possible. The best thing for a child's upbringing is for a family unit to be as strong as possible. These are values that we will be promoting uh, in, in New York, in Albany, in our executive branch, in our policy, it's something that I believe strongly in, and it's in the best interest of our, of our kids, students first, that we promote this as a state government. Where do you stand on both school, charter schools and school vouchers? And if you are in favor, which I, I think it's safe to assume you are, how do you ensure that public schools are not hurt by having them? Uh, I believe that we should lift the cap on charter schools. Uh, I believe I support educational savings accounts, tax credits for school choice. Uh, I believe that all kids deserve access to a quality education. My daughters, as I mentioned earlier, go to the same public school that I went to. I believe that competition is good. I am not, uh, I, I'm not favoring all sorts of different educations against each other. I want to promote all forms of education to do better. If any type of an education out there, if there's any school out there that wants to declare themselves perfect, then I will be even more suspicious of you because there's no such thing as a perfect classroom. There's no such thing as a perfect school or a perfect school district. We will challenge everyone to do as best as possible. And as long as everyone is constantly deeply committed to lifting up their game, lifting up their standard of performance as a consequence, we will end up with better schools of all forms and we'll have better outcomes. New York spends 
approximately 25,000 or so per pupil on our kids. If you look at places like Florida and Mississippi, you'll see that New York spends two and a half times as much. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at the performance of fourth grade reading and math, black students, Hispanic students, low income students, their students are performing much better than their peers on the same exact tests. And New York is spending two and a half times as much. Now that doesn't mean that New York should start spending you know, uh, uh, the same amount that Mississippi does on education. I'm not, listen, let's be honest and realistic in this conversation. What we're talking about is absolutely investing in education, but we have to look at why it is that these blacks and Hispanic students and low-income students and other students are not performing as well as their peers in these other locations when we're spending two and a half times as much money. Uh, so uh, listen, I, I, I am not in favor of a blank check to anyone. Uh, I'm not here to say that uh, if you are in public school, that if, if you are a public school, well then no scrutiny for you. You're doing a perfect job you know, kudos, pat on the back, just because you're a public school, or if you're just because you're a charter school, that you're doing a perfect job, outstanding job, here's a pat on the back, you've achieved perfection. No, everybody needs to strive to do better. Right now, the policy for the Department of Education is that unvaccinated parents are not allowed to enter New York City public schools. So in my school with my son, I, I can go in because I'm vaccinated, but many parents cannot if we have a, a great coffee or parents coffee. Do you support that policy? Uh, I do not support any COVID vaccine mandates of any sort for any purpose. I don't believe that anybody should be fired for the personal decision of whether or not to get the COVID vaccine. Uh, I don't believe that a child should be left out of extracurricular activities. I don't believe that a, that a young student at a higher ed, CUNY, SUNY, uh, community college or elsewhere should be blocked out of a classroom. I don't believe that a parent should be blocked out of uh, being uh, any part at all of their child's uh, education whatsoever just because of the COVID vaccine. I do not support any COVID vaccines at all. An issue not related to education, but important to many in our audience is the issue of abortion. But many people in our audience are concerned with, uh, with the recent Supreme Court decision permitting abortion. What approach would a Governor Zeldin take to abortion laws in New York State? New York a few years ago codified far more than Roe. When we all woke up in New York, the day after the Dobbs decision, the law in New York was exactly the same as it was the day before. Nothing changed, not a comma. Nothing at all about New York law changed, and I'm not gonna roll that law back. On the issue of the economy, New York is one of the highest tax states in the country. Uh, when you add the New York City tax, it is even higher. What is your approach going to be towards New York State and New York City taxes? And also, if you could talk about your approach towards the SALT deduction, which was lost a few years ago. So as it relates to the state and local tax deduction, it's called SALT. Uh, I am one of those people who have long been saying that the reason why our SALT deductions were as high as they were was because their state and local taxes are as high as they are. And one of the reasons why New York leads the entire nation in population loss is because of New York's taxes. We need tax relief across the board. We need to bring down the cost of living here in New York. Uh, I support getting rid of the estate tax in New York. Uh, I believe that we need to bring down the in income tax across the board here in the state of New York. Uh, we need to make New York state government operate more efficiently over the course of the last three years funded a lot on one shots that came from the federal government, New York ended up increasing by tens of billions of dollars, the annual budget. Over $220 billion now is the annual budget of the state of New York. And what happens is whatever the next year's budget becomes, that's the, the baseline for the following year's budget. I'm telling you, regardless of how good it feels, to be spending over $220 billion, it is absolutely unsustainable. This increase is going to destroy the state. They are going to have to increase taxes more and more and more to fund these out of control priorities, especially the reality being that the reason why it is now in over $220 billion 
uh, budget is not because there's $220 billion in reoccurring revenue. They're funding it based off of one shots and it is just a one shot. And we cannot be relying on annual bailouts from the federal government, especially annual bailouts to go larger and larger and larger. But we need tax relief across the board, uh, whether it's a state tax, uh, whether it is income tax. Uh, I believe if we brought down the income tax rate across the board, uh, that would factor into decisions that are being made right now of people deciding to go to other states where they will be paying less in taxes and their money will go further. The congestion pricing tax is coming soon, potentially. You stated your opposition to it. Can you tell us what you would do on day one regarding the congestion pricing tax? I totally oppose congestion pricing. I will do absolutely everything in my power to stop congestion pricing. Uh, it is, uh, in one respect, uh, deeply ironic when you look at the environmental impacts that they call this congestion pricing because it's going to result in more truck traffic in the Bronx. It's going to result in more truck traffic uh, on Staten Island. It's going to result in more cars driving through uh, side streets in Queens and, and Brooklyn trying to get to new routes uh, so that they don't have to pay the fee. You already have a lot of New Yorkers who are hitting their breaking point in this state. Now you want to slap this fee on on top of it. You have a mayor and others calling for New Yorkers to return back to New York City. Now you're going to make it even less likely that New Yorkers will return to Manhattan if you're now going to make them pay a new fee on top of the, the increased cost of gas and the tolls that already exist and the parking fees that have to be paid. Uh, this is a bad idea. You want more people riding public transportation? Make the public transportation safer. If you're, if you're looking for more revenue, on top of increasing ridership by making it safer, enforce fair jumping instead of what, what we see right now of Alvin Bragg from his day one memo where he says that he's not going to enforce fair jumping at all. And you see people abusing it now as an entitlement. So I oppose congestion pricing. I'm committed to doing absolutely everything in my power to stop it. Do you have an alternative in terms of limiting Uber and Lyft or anything in that sort? Well, this is one of the problems is that when they do the estimates of how much congestion pricing is going to yield for the MTA, they're not factoring in the reality of all of the different exemptions that are absolutely going to be coming down the pike if they move forward with congestion pricing. And there's going to be all sorts of carve outs. So the estimates economically aren't even accurate. Uh, I believe that the exemption that should be promoted here is a total exemption. Nobody should have to pay the congestion pricing fee. You want to get more money into the MTA? You want to increase ridership, make it safer, improve the service, and make people pay the fee. And listen, if there's somebody who needs to use public transportation and they can't afford a couple of dollars to get through, well, that's something that we can have a conversation on. But what we have right now isn't somebody you know, swiping a card that has a free ride on it. We have people jumping turnstiles, and that needs to be illegal no matter what. Congressman, I'm now going to turn it over to Place Co-Secretary Gene Hahn, who's been monitoring our chat and picking up some questions from the audience. Gene, Gene, would you like to share some of the these questions? Uh, sure. I, hello, Congressman. It's hello. Um, nice to nice to hear from you. Um, uh, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, first question is actually from myself and from uh, many parents that I hear that are like myself. Uh, I'm a Democrat, and have I. I've almost always voted for Democrats, but because of the direction education has taken, uh, numerous parents that I hear from are we are saying the same things uh, that we want to keep an open mind for November. Uh, that being said, one lingering concern that I have, and I also hear from this, these same parents, is about January six. Can you what can you tell undecided voters about your position on this? Well, every uh, January six that a just for historical purposes. Uh, every January 6th, uh, every time a Republican has been elected, there have been Democrats on the floor of the House of Representatives articulating their objections to the results. Over the course of the last few decades, every single time a Republican has been elected, people are articulating objections on the floor. Now, I was on the floor of the House of Representatives on January 6th, 2017, when there were all sorts of objections being debated. I was on the floor of the House of Representatives on January 6th, 2021, when 
all sorts of objections were being debated. Now, something that happened on January 6, 2021, that can absolutely never happen ever again in our country. It shouldn't have happened on January 6, 2021. It's a sight that I don't want to ever see on any date inside of the United States Capitol is the violence, the, the looting, the people who are getting hurt. It has no place in the United States Capitol. As soon as I learned of it, I immediately condemned it. On the floor of the House of Representatives, we didn't know what was happening, although we knew something was happening uh, outside of that chamber. It's a sight that I never want to see again as a proud American, as a military veteran, as a congressman. Uh, I, I don't want to, 40 years from now, live through anyone who is trying to justify any repeat in any way, shape, or form of what we witnessed with regards to that violence, the trespassing, uh, the people who are getting hurt, the looting, the stealing. Absolutely none of it is welcome. I did not support it. I don't support it and it can never possibly be repeated again. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, next question. Many parents saw the direct harms of remote learning and the mental health crisis that it created for children, especially special education children. Your opponent's platform includes a mention of mental health recovery for students and teachers, but has not laid out a plan and seems somewhat vague. To what degree would you agree that mental health recovery is an issue? And if so, what are some of your ideas to get kids back to normalcy? Uh, it's a massive, uh, it's a massive level, an issue of importance. It's something that I believe is a responsibility of the state of New York uh, as a consequence of the policies that came from the state of New York. They mandated policies that created additional mental health impacts. Uh, it, in, in theory, and this is something that I was talking about in real time during the pandemic uh, and, in, and as it relates to the science, for those people who care about science and research and data, our youngest generation was the generation that should have been the least impacted by COVID. It, you look at transmissibility, severe reaction, death, uh, the, our, our youngest kids should have been the generation that was least adversely impacted. Somehow government got involved and, re, and as a consequence of the government going so far in, in ignoring common sense and not listening to other aspects of science and research and data. The developmental, mental, emotional, and physical harm that was done to our kids resulted in our youngest generation being the generation that was adversely impacted the most. Now, what I've seen is as a consequence of unfunded mandates, the first positions that, that go inside of these schools or the school psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, there is an important role to be played for individual students who seek out help to be able to speak to uh, professionals to get guidance on how to work through an issue. Uh, there's peer pressure, there's social media, maybe they have issues at home, they're struggling with tests, they wanna get their grades up, they, uh, you know, they just have other stressors in life and they need someone to talk to outside of a setting with a whole lot of other students inside of a classroom and they're unable to get the individualized one-on-one -on -one attention that they need. So I believe that investing in mental health is not just something that is aspirational. I believe that it should be viewed as a legal liability, a legal responsibility on the part of the state to make up for the developmental, mental, emotional, physical harm caused by the government in pandemic era policies. Thank you so much. Um, this is a question about uh, governance over the state, New York State Education Department and the Board of Regents. Um, it, it's not clear to many people about uh, how that is actually structured, but um, with uh, the ultimate oversight the state having the ultimate oversight over education, um, would you be able to influence um, the education department and the board of regents to promote academic excellence and improve education outcomes for all students, especially yeah. those that are persistently underperforming? Absolutely, I think it's outrageous when you hear a governor saying that the education department is outside of their purview as if they're not even, even allowed to have an opinion. They're not allowed to state that opinion publicly. They're not allowed to state that opinion publicly and try to sway public opinion as if the state budget 
doesn't have anything to do with education, as if the state legislature and governor doesn't have any powers uh, as it pertains to creating laws. The education department right now is acting like a fourth branch of government. They are unaccountable to the people. Parents don't feel like stakeholders at the education department. Teachers aren't feeling like stakeholders. Students aren't feeling like stakeholders. We talk about term limits for the governor and other positions, which by the way, I totally support and I would even term limit myself, regardless of whether or not they even term limit me through the legislature. I would not be running for a third term no matter what. You also are seeing the need for term limits at the, the Board of Regents. You bring your ideas, your energy, you try to make a difference, and then it is time to move on. There are people who are, are there at the Board of Regents like this is a lifetime position, unaccountable to nobody. There needs to be a house cleaning at the education department. There needs, there's a need for new blood. There's a need to force accountability and ensure that parents, students, and teachers all feel like they have a seat at the table again at the education department. Oh, thank, uh, thank you so much. Uh, next question. Uh, this is non-education related, but I think weighs heavily on the minds of many people. What would you do as governor to reverse or adjust no cash bail? So I am committed to doing absolutely everything in my power to uh, repeal cashless bail. I believe that judges should have discretion to weigh dangerousness. Uh, I referenced earlier about some guy taking an ax out of their backpack and getting released on cashless bail after swinging it as customers, uh, swinging it at tables and walls. There was a woman last Wednesday in the Buffalo area who was murdered in front of her three kids. She was murdered by her husband who was released a day earlier, was charged with a slew of domestic violence offenses, but the judge did not have the power to keep him detained because of New York's cashless bail law and the, the inaction by this state legislature and governor, they should have instead already have given judges discretion to weigh dangerousness so that that judge could have keep that person detained. Released him last Tuesday, one week ago today, and one week ago tomorrow, that mother was murdered by that husband in front of their three kids. That mother was telling everybody he is going to murder me. When she was murdered last Wednesday, she was wearing a bulletproof vest. And I believe that this shouldn't be viewed as a Republican versus Democrat issue. Mayor of the city of New York says that judges should have discretion to weigh dangerousness. He's right. I, will, I look forward to working with the mayor. I want to work with any, anybody on either side of the aisle to overhaul cashless bail. I've been campaigning on this issue, and I believe that my election four weeks from today would be earning a mandate on this issue. I would, be, I would believe, I would say, I would argue that it is the will of the people that by us winning this election on November 8th, the people of New York have been heard. The voice of the voters of New York have been heard. They want cashless bail overhauled. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm gonna ask one last question here. Um, it's on restorative justice practices that are used in, in schools. Do you think that they have a usefulness in schools for resolving serious issues, behavioral issues with students? And then what, what recommend, what, I'm sorry, what other rem remedies would you recommend if that is not, uh, for example, changes to the behavioral code, police intervention, um, or other methods of response? So first off, let me say that my approach as a member of Congress has been to believe uh, and advocate for state and local control. My, ad my advocacy in Albany will be to continue to advocate for local control to the max. What might work in one school district might not work in another. What might be a, a positive lesson learned in one type of an education uh, might not work in another. Uh, I believe that we need to improve the relationship between schools and local law enforcement. Uh, I believe that communication needs to be improved with local law enforcement. Uh, I, I have, I, my kids go to a school that when I went to their school uh, and I went kindergarten through 12th grade there, they're in the 11th grade, they started in that school district when they were in kindergarten. It is so much safer in that school district now 
than when I went to those schools. There's just so much less fighting. The, the, the punishments have been increased. Uh, there is a zero tolerance policy across the board on so much bad activity. And it's a culture that gets set at the beginning. Uh, so what we have to look at is what works for the individual school district. Uh, we need to ensure that we are that we don't have any school district that is becoming a sanctuary for any type of crime. There, there is there should be a zero tolerance for any school district having any tolerance for criminality and bad activity inside of that school. Sometimes you see a school getting so protective of their school and the data. They're worried about the scrutiny, the bad press, that they end up covering up bad activity inside of their school. They're, we need to ensure that we, are, that we are cracking down totally on any school district that has any tolerance whatsoever for this bad activity. But my preference is that we have maximum local control. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask one last question. Thank you, that was great. Um, this one is um, from a parent um, asking about vaccination and inconsistencies. So Governor Hochul has lifted the, the COVID mandates, but the, we, as we see in New York City with parents, unvaccinated parents not being allowed into buildings, there are still inconsistencies here and there. And even among places when you, like private businesses, for example, that may say, oh, you know, we don't allow unvaccinated children in. What would you do as governor to create more consistency across the state in conforming to what is essentially um, the state regulation? Well, what I will do on the first day that I'm in office is implement my position that there shouldn't be any COVID vaccine mandates anywhere. Whatever I can possibly do to the fullest extent of my power, I will do on my own on day one the first day that I'm in office, I oppose all COVID vaccine mandates in every form everywhere. I will do everything in my power the first day that I'm in office, right after I'm sworn in, to get rid of every COVID mandate I can. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Um, and thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it back over to Lucas, or I'm sorry, to Craig. Craig, thank I think you. you were going to conclude. Thanks, Gene. Uh, so I want to uh, give you an opportunity, uh, Congressman, to uh, make a closing statement as we're getting close to the 45-minute uh, mark. I, I would certainly be very grateful for uh, our continued work together. Uh, thank you for the endorsement uh, of Place NYC in the past. Uh, grateful for your advocacy, for your mobilization efforts. As a parent of 11th graders, uh, a lot of what you advocate for stands to benefit my daughters and their generation. Uh, I hope that your numbers only continue to improve. Four weeks from today is an election where uh, we, we really have to take our vote very seriously. I believe uh, in my heart of hearts that our state is heading in the wrong direction. And then if we give Kathy Hochul four more years and that we have one party rule and we have a lack of balance of power up in Albany, it, that things will actually get worse. I want to do everything in my power to work with all of you to the max uh, to be able to fight for our kids who aren't even old enough to vote. We have our own vote, but we have to be casting our vote also for our kids to be casting it as their vote as well. And I, and I know that if you know our four-year-olds were given a vote, they'd be single-issue voters. Uh, which, uh, which candidate promises not to put me in a mask all day? Uh, I, I promise the, the two-year-olds and the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds that kid on the autism spectrum, learning how to speak, unable to see uh, their teacher and the teacher can't see theirs. Listen, there's so many lessons learned of what has been done wrong. There's a lot of lessons learned over the course of these last few years of what uh, we have seen done right in individual school districts. And I wanna do everything in my power to improve the quality of education in New York. And I wanna work with all of you to be able to get that done. Grateful for your time. Uh, I'm glad that I was able to answer all these questions. I'm happy that you recorded all of them. Uh, I am on the record. I am always on the record, happy to answer any question possible. 
And I believe that it would be very healthful, healthy and helpful for our state and to our voters for there to be multiple debates with Governor Hochul across New York. Uh, I believe that they should start right now. I believe that they should have started already. People have been voting for two and a half weeks, but the governor only wants to do a single debate at the end of October for one hour on cable uh, over a month after the start of mail-in absentee voting. I believe that it's important for us to have these dialogues now. Uh, listen, it would, be, it would be best if I was leaving you to go jump on a debate with the governor, but at least we had this time together and I'm grateful for everyone for participating. Thank you so much to uh, Congressman Zeldin for coming tonight and allowing us to get to know you and your vision for New York. Thank you to all of our audience for joining us and submitting questions. You can more, learn more about Congressman Zeldin by visiting his site, www.zeldinfornewyork.com. And remember, you can find out more information about Place NYC by visiting us at www.placenyc.org. We'd like to remind you that election day is only a few weeks away, Tuesday, November 8th, plus there's early voting. Please remember that your vote will count. Thank you, everybody, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night.